Hey, welcome everybody. Um, if you're here uh, for the first time, as Beth gave you that uh, welcome, I know some of you may be here because you've got friends or family who are being baptized. The baptisms will be uh, at the end of our gathering today. You're like, oh, I wanted to get away quick. You know, baptize and I can go get some lunch. Um, hang on, I I'm going to preach record short today. Well, I did at nine. We'll see how I go at 11. Uh, but welcome. Uh, my name is Des, I'm the lead pastor here, and uh, it is just my honor to be able to bring a message to you today, but I want to really hit this. We are doing this series called Unleashing Grace. We did one a year ago, we'll do it every single year because our mission never changes. How we do it should always be changing, but the mission never changes, and so we here at Grace Community Church want to unleash the grace of God. So as the video said, and we really thought about this, are you feeling like overwhelmed or restless? And that to me was my sense of where people are at at the moment. Either overwhelmed with life or all that's going on or restless. And restless was the one word I could find that meant, Nyah! you know, restless is just like, well, things change. I'm frustrated. I cannot do this, 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 this anymore. I want to. Just so much going on that you feel that sense of restless. And it sounded better overwhelmed and restless than overwhelmed and angst. Overwhelmed and what? But it's just that, you know what that feels like. It's a condition of your mind, it's a condition of your heart, it's a condition of your soul. Are you feeling that way? Because if you are, there is a better way. And so this series is about inviting all of us to encounter and experience the grace of Jesus. Because when his grace is unleashed, everything changes. And so this series, we get to go about that. Now, if you were not here last week, I kind of want to say go home and watch it because it flows, each week flows from the other. But if you were not here last week, I want to encourage you, go ahead, take the time through our app or our website and listen to last week's message because something significant to the foundation was there. I talked about this particular illustration and I'll briefly describe it again. There was a bridge built in 1998 in Honduras over the Choloteca River called the Choloteca Bridge. It was built this way and designed by engineers to withstand the many storms and hurricanes that came into that region every year, often leaving devastation and often destroying bridges, which was significant to get across the river. They designed this particular bridge to be hurricane proof, and sure enough, in 98, Hurricane Mitch blew through Honduras, dropping 75 inches of rain out of nowhere, 80 to 90 miles per hour winds, ripping through and destroying many, many bridges, except for the Choloteca Bridge that stood against the storm. However, after the storm, this happened. Put the picture up. After the storm, this happened. What had happened was the storm was so unbelievable that the river created a new channel. The river created a new channel. And so after the storm, even though the bridge was still standing strong, it was no longer serving the purpose for which it was created. It was no longer acting as a bridge. It was standing. It had survived the storm, but it was no longer meeting and living out its purpose. The river moved. In the last few decades, culturally, the river has moved here in Tempe. And if we, the church, are to be like a bridge, well, the river's moved. But even more so, in 2020, we all know, the river has moved. The river has really moved in this year as well. So even more so, we've got to listen and go, okay, who are we? Why do we exist? What is our purpose? What is our mission? And we need to affect that. Now, as I said, baptism was at the end today, which is great. But this Thursday, 6.30, we're going to gather outside here, outside this building at 6.30 for prayer. You're all invited. Invite friends if you want as well. We're going to meet outside for a couple of reasons. Number one, for those who are not comfortable meeting in close proximity, we're going to be outside. So that helps with that. We're going to be moving around in different prayer stations. I'm going to be praying. I'll tell you what we're praying for right now. Next Thursday is the final Thursday before the election. We're going to be praying for the city of Tempe. The build-up to the election, the election itself, and after the election. 
I'm going to be praying for those things. I'm going to pray for the state of Arizona. The build up to the election, the election itself, and after the election. Station number three, we're going to be praying for the nation. The build up to the election, the election itself, and after the election. And the impact on the nation and the White House and all of that related to it. And then station number four, we're going to be praying for the Big C Church. Here's the why. All those previous three things are going to be changing, but the mission of the church never changes. It is clear. It is there. We need to know that the church, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is king over and above all. And regardless of the result in 10 days time, Jesus is still king. His kingdom is advancing. His church will prevail. Nothing will stand against it. We need to be unified in that. And we are to be the ones to unleash grace in all of that. Now we should be praying for the nation. We should be praying for all leaders because God wants us to. But in comparison, we need to get divine order in our praying for all of this. And some people are losing their mind in the build-up to this election. Now it's okay if King Jesus is not your king. Lose your mind. Be overwhelmed and restless. But if Jesus is your king, you should not be overwhelmed and restless about this election and losing your mind. It's all going to go bad. It's all going to go wrong. Come on now. But we should be praying for it. So I want to invite you to come. And you'll be gathering. And you'll be praying with a brother or sister who won't vote like you will. And you don't have to talk about it. Because you're praying his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven through all of that. But we should pray and we should be concerned. Absolutely. So Thursday, 6.30, it'll be about an hour. And it'll be outside and we'll move around and it's all going to be good. For those of you who are watching online today, people have asked me, will the prayer gathering be online? I have no idea how technologically we can do that other than this. I might maybe we'll do it like Facebook Live and somebody will walk around. That may be a way of of navigating that for those of you who can't gather. I'm not promising we'll do that, but we're going to try our best to make it available for those who can't physically gather on Thursday. But as I said, we can spread out and we'll be outside 6.30 till about 7.30 to be praying for a significant, significant thing, isn't it, guys? It's significant, very significant. But the most significant thing for me is in the build-up and the day and the aftermath. We have a role to play. We have a role to play. Anyway, the mission, just like a bridge, the mission, we're married to it. We're married to the mission. We're fully committed to the mission. The method in which we apply the mission, or the river's moved. We constantly have to look at that, but the mission is clear. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, follower of Jesus, is... To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. To love your neighbor as yourself. To go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I'll be with you always, even to the very end of the age. There's five core purposes. We remember them by using the word grace that's spelt G-R-A-C-E. And we remember those five core purposes by using the words grow, reach, adore, connect, engage. That isn't as important as today's message. I'm not going to start with G. I'm going to start with A, the largest of the digits on your hand, because it's the word adore, which is worship, which is love God. It starts there. It's all got to start love God. So turn with me, if you've got a Bible, to the Gospel of Mark. The Bible is in two sections, those who aren't familiar, an Old Testament or Old Covenant and a New Testament or New Covenant. The printed Bible, the New Testament, is about 25% of a printed Bible. And it starts with those Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So the second one is Mark. I'm going to go to chapter 12, and it's a familiar thing. We always recite the great commandment, but I like us to read it, see its context. It's declared in the scriptures on a number of occasions. The first time we see it is in the Old Testament, in the books of the law, in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And the Lord says this through Moses and says this. It's called this word Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Shema means listen. Listen! Can I get your attention? He's saying, listen, hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord alone. Even in the Hebrew, Shema Israel, Adonai Elohino, Adonai Echad. There's something very, 
And then he goes, mm, now, now I've got your attention. Listen to this. So in that context, Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. This was Jesus and a bunch of other people. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him. So this teacher of the law goes to Jesus and says, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Let me ask you that question. What's the most important thing for you? I think it's a great question, what matters most? Like when you wake up, what matters most? What really is the most important thing? Are you feeling overwhelmed or restless? Sometimes that's because we've just got things out of order. We've allowed the things to rule us that probably aren't the most important thing. What is the most important thing? And, and it's always been there. There's so many questions you can relate to that. People ask a question, why am I here? Why do I exist? What's my purpose? Is there more to life than this? These are core human cravings. They're key. They've always been around. And it's driven humanity to do some incredible breakthrough things selflessly. And here we have it, similar deal. A guy's got, okay. You know, what's the most important thing, Jesus? Of all the commandments that we've got, like which one? What, what's the one we need to give the maximum attention to when he says this? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. I mean, just to make it clear, he's saying, here's your question, what's the most important? I'll give you the answer, all, 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 and I'll just nail it and underline it at the end, highlight a pen, put a nice box around it, and a bow, there is no commandment. No commandment greater than this. Let's nail it. It's immovable. Like, in terms of mission, it's clear. That's our existence. To unleash grace is to love God with all. That's what unleashing grace is. Now, it's the other things as well, but that's what it is. What's your most important thing? So, worship. Love God is this word, Worship, and often we worship, we relate it to singing, and it's not exclusively singing, there's more to it, but there is something divinely incredible about corporate worship, which I'll touch on, but worship at its heart is this. I have encountered, and I can speak from the first person a few times today, and that is this. Worship, for me, every time gets me through any difficult season gets me through any difficult situation, brings a breakthrough that I don't normally can see a breakthrough. Worship enables me to do that. Now, how is that possible? In fact, I would say worship is when I encounter and experience God's grace the most. I'm reminded of so much. How is that? Because it shifts my focus from the problem to the problem solver. It shifts my focus from the weakness I feel in the situation to he who is strong. It shifts my problem from the fear that's gripping me to the faith he's inspiring me to have. It moves me from being unstable and insecure into his rock and firm foundation. Worship does that. Worship is that angle, that posture, that expression that leads me there every single time. So worship or to love God is best described, I think, in two S words, sacrifice and surrender. When you break it all down, like what is worship? The heart of worship is surrender. That's the heart of it. There's a letting go. There's an all in. Surrender is the heart of worship. That's why I relate to it. That's why I find it, and maybe it's different for you, with a raising hands thing. I mean, don't shoot is a surrender posture. But there is something adoring and yet surrendered. A palms open, palms up, surrendered posture 
is so important, surrender and sacrifice. Now, love, let's look at it just in a human sense. Love is best seen through surrender and sacrifice. People will often example love story or love encounters with that. They'll see somebody sacrificing and surrendering and go, wow, look how much they love to do that. So in the same context, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son sacrifice. Oh, greater love is no man than this, than a man lays down his life for his friends. The expression is there, surrender and sacrifice. Today I want to help you, even give you some tools or some things to help unlock your heart in worship. Of all the things that I could do a 50-week series on, if I'm not going to, but if I could do a 50-week series, it will be worship. Because it's just everywhere. We would never run out of scripture. It's just everywhere. Why? Because it's the most important thing. Love God with everything. Now, let me just pick up this. I emphasize the love God with all. You picked up my emphasis, all, your heart. Let me just say it. That is about emotion. Even in the earthly sense, husbands, we all know, if you're going to say to your wife, I love you, I don't feel like you do. Well, just get over it. I just do. That's not going to go down too well. But I just do. There's an expression. There's got to be an emotion connected. Now, in a sense of loving God, it is emotional. And people get all freaking out. Oh, we don't want to be about sensationalism and blah, 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 blah. I'm not talking about that. If I love and adore, that is emotional. It is. And the Lord commands us to love him with all our heart. Then he goes all our soul. There's a spiritual thing, but the soul, mind, will, and emotions all built in. The soul, to me, we know we have neurons in our belly, don't we? It's a scientific fact. We have two brains, one here and one here. This one wins for me a lot. But anyway, we have two brains. But there is, from your very core of your being, streams of living water will flow, Jesus. There's a very core of here, all your soul. It's like, oh, it just goes everything. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. That is related to your physical body. It is all your strength. Oh, it's mental strength. No, because mine's coming up. Physical body. Oh, just an aside, those from last week. Remember the change or die or change and live? 90% of all bypass patients don't change. They choose to die. And for some of you, I know that last week felt like a bit of a, you're having a go at my physical health. Yes, I was. How's it going? Sounds like you're bullying me. No, I'm just caring. I'm caring. Make the change or die. Your choice. Change or die. Or change and live. But expressing God in worship physically is related to that. Read the scriptures, lifting holy hands, kneeling down, lying down. There is something about that. And I know some of us have all got different personalities. And I know I struggle to stand still. Just normally. I understand that. But there is something about the physical connection. What is a humble posture? What do we do for humility? What do we do for gratitude? What do we do? There's expression that comes through us. And so I want to help. It's, it's good. There's something about just the body, the energy that you get because you're loving God with everything. Heart, soul, strength, and then your mind, your thoughts, your thinking through. There is something. Some of you here have got an intellectual spiritual pathway, maybe more than an artistic one. So are you feeding that? Are you fueling the connection with God, even in your mind and in your thinking, loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? You need some truth in there. And when we come to this in a minute, declaring truth is a mind thing. Acting your way into the feeling is a biblical thing. Let me just demonstrate this for you. The posture of acting your way into a feeling may think, is that faking it? Yeah, fake it till you make it. Is it faking it? No, it's a faithing it not faking it. I'm faithing it. Made that word up, I think. 
If it's in the dictionary, I don't know. But if it ever does get in there, you heard it first here. Anyway, faithing it. Here's what it is. This is who God is. This is what he says he is, who he says he is. This is true. He says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. I'm going to go there even though I don't feel great right now, even though I can't feel his grace right now, even though I can't feel his love, his mercy, his strength, his power, his forgiveness. I believe it. And so I'm going to declare it, declare it, declare it, declare it, declare it until the feeling catches up. That's praise. That's Worship, I choose to love. I praise you, God, because I love you. I love you, so I will praise you. They go on like that. That, that spiral is there. There's an expression that's important. And so when we want to love God with everything, we unleash grace. So let me ask this question. We can't talk about unleashing grace without first saying, well, what needs to be unleashed? What is leashed in your worship right now? What needs letting go? What is holding you back from encountering the grace of God in your praise, in your worship, in your love of God? What is holding you back? It's quite simple. This is Beth picked up before. It's your heart. So what has your heart right now? What is sat on the throne of your life? What has the greatest attention, greatest affection, greatest desire? What is that greatest thing? The Lord desires to be on the throne of your life, but often we put other things on there. What is it? It's a condition of your heart. You know, and that's often where it's connected. Treasure and heart do go together. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, you don't know if money is the most important thing to you until you give it away. And the sheer fact that you twitch when you think you might have to give it away is a bit of a clue. You don't know what has you until you surrender it and sacrifice it. And the Lord said, I just want your heart. Worship him with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Do we have a posture that says we want to do whatever it takes, God, to see your mission fulfilled? Whatever it takes. Let me just mention this because I know on this subject I can get very inspirational, motivational, fire you up, all of that. But let me just contextualize this really important when it comes to giving God everything. Luke chapter 9, Jesus says these words. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, that means follow him. He must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and let lose or forfeit his very self, his soul? This is a daily decision. It's not about me. It's a daily decision to deny self worship him, love him, follow him. It's a daily decision. So if your concept of worship is 20 minutes on a Sunday, you have got severe malnutrition, significant malnutrition. But if this is a daily love God with everything because it's the most important thing, then health is there. It's a daily decision. That means what are you listening to? Where is your heart? Where is your focus? It's a daily, daily thing. Where is it happening? Is it in the car? Is it in the shower? Is it in your room? Is it in your living room? What's the, what's the soundtrack of your life? What are the things that you get to declare over your life? Romans 12 verse 1. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, Offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. What is your spiritual act of worship? To offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Here's the good news. In the Old Testament, the sacrifices to God were all we got alive things and we killed them. 
Animals were offered for, this is my sin sacrifice. This is my, please forgive me sacrifice. This is my grateful sacrifice. These things were all, the animal kingdom was so grateful that in the end, we don't have to do it anymore. So these sacrifices were made, but then Jesus, the lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world became the once and for all sacrifice. We no longer need to offer things to sacrifice to God. He just says, offer yourself as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. That means I choose to place my life, put you on the throne and me surrendered to the throne of you, King Jesus, daily. I stand here and I say to you, there have been a gazillion days when I don't do that. I think I may be in company with others similar. Not all of you, because I know some of you in your way too, anyway. But, but for me, there's a gazillion days when my daily choice is not that. But when it is. So, in offering a living sight, I want to now give you something that I was thinking about this going through the week, and I'm thinking, how is it that when I do worship, it's like every time, boom, breakthrough. Every time. Every time I connect in all kinds of different ways, different things can inspire me to worship the Lord. I can connect in different songs in different ways. I can connect in worship to instrumental. What, what, how is it? How does that work? And so because it's my number one pathway of walk with the Lord, I had to think back, when was it that it went click? What was the click moment for me? And I thought back and I thought, I think this is what it was. Let me help you give you this how you can look upon the Lord to help you worship. And then I'll get into some practicals. First of all, this God is holy. The heaven, the revelation says they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, what does that really mean? Let me help you, Kadosh in the original language. It means set apart. The problem with set apart, it doesn't mean push to one side. Set apart means Bigger than, greater than, way beyond more than. It is so set apart. It's at such another level. It's in a league of its own. Whatever phrase you want to use, holy is way above, better than, purer than, more powerful than, more greater than, more awesome than you could possibly imagine he is holy. Now with that in mind, the original Hebrew people always viewed God in two dual characters. And this really helped me. When viewing God and trying to express my heart for God, the two characters really helped me. Number one, they see God as king. And number two, they see God as father or shepherd. I want to help you. For some of you, the word father is not an easy thing to appropriate with worship. I understand that. And the Lord knows that. And so you think of the word father and you don't often think of things in a really special way. But what about shepherd? And so you can see the Lord as king or shepherd or father, whichever helps in your posturing in worship. King means you see him as all-powerful, mighty, warrior, conqueror, ruler, provider, protector, leader, director, for everything to do with king. Everything is there. He is king. And so I praise the Lord and I see him as king, way more above, so much stronger, so much greater. He is king, King Jesus, King Jesus. Now, when I enter then into worship, though, we have him as Shepherd or his father, loving, merciful, his kindness, his compassion, his generosity, his patience. His loving kindness that leads us to repentance, the scriptures say. And so for some of you, I will enter with praise, but there's a moment of ah. Oh, you can see it, and maybe you're not connected. Even when we have corporate worship and we sing songs that are declaration songs in praise, and yet we can sit with that third song today, but I just love you. That there's a worship moment. You'll see it throughout the Psalms. You'll see this expression going in. But, but I want you to know that the majesty of King Jesus 
And yet he's a shepherd who can come and you can come alongside him and listen to me. He's the God who'll come and when you stumble, he'll pick you up. He'll put soothing balm on your graze knees. Just pick your chin up. There's a moment where you can, you can encounter that level of grace in the worship. You can be brought to tears hearing a phrase. You can feel all conquering with the very presence of the Lord and his grace going, yes, all things are possible. You can declare truths into all of that. So just to help a little bit, expressing your heart in worship, I've said this as well, I just want to somehow help you get your heart out. And if that king and shepherd or king and father, daily, like daily, what is it? So many ways. So this is super quick right now. Because here's four things on the why worship, the why, why praise, why worship that are really important, biblical truth, experiencing his grace. First one is when you praise, when we love God in adoration in that way, we invite grace into our present situation. It's an invitation for grace. It's an invitation for the very presence of God. Psalm 22, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. I've said this many times, it will never leave me. 15, 18 years ago, I read this in a book. Somebody translated direct Psalm 22 verse 3 in the Japanese straight into street English. And it pretty much said this, when God's people sing, he brings a big chair and sits there. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people, whichever one you prefer. The Lord inhabits the praise of his people, or when God's people sing, he brings a big chair and sits there. You invite in. It just is true. You invite him into your very present situation. Now, there is a progression, remember the act way into a feeling, of declaring what is true for the Lord and it helping in a problem situation. Let me just read to you from Psalm 34. Psalm 34, if you're a quick middle of your Bible deal, Psalms, you can find it. Psalm 34. See the progression of praise, but then the Lord being there and helping overcome a problem. Starts with this. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. I, I can't read that. This is where I struggle. Can I just be honest with you right now? This is where I struggle with praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's good. God's good. Praise the Lord. I, um, my soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We could stop there, but we shouldn't. Because verse four then goes on. See that posture? Come on. This is what we're going to do. Verse four. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. It's a condition of your soul, fear. Praise, 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 praise. Oh, I see you, God. I encounter your grace. My faith is secure in you. The circumstances haven't changed, but my fear, oh, it's changed. In reflection of you and your majesty and your greatness and your loving kindness and your gentleness and all those things. Absolutely incredible, awesome, I love it. Number two, so we invite him, we invite grace into our situation when we pray. Secondly, it resizes everything. Resizes, what I mean by that is, whatever circumstance you're in right now, it gets into divine order because the more you praise, the bigger God comes into view. You don't change the size of God, but you see him bigger. When I praise, I see God bigger. I know he's not changed, but my perspective of him has. So if things are overwhelming you and you're feeling restless, you need to see God big. It enlarges that. 
And you could be in a horrific, dark situation. The doorway to, oh, well, the way to open the door out of that is praise. I haven't got time, but I'll quickly pick this up. Acts 16 talks about Paul and Silas who were on a mission from God. God sent them to Philippi and he told them, go to that city. You're going to reveal my gospel to lead to some people. Breakthrough will take place. This is your mission. Yes, let's go. They go there and they get arrested. They get beaten and flogged. They get put in prison and they get put inside the prison in the prison, put in stocks in the prison, in the prison, in the prison, already beaten, already flogged and God told them to go there on a mission from God. Uh, Deny self, take up your cross and follow me. But when they're in the prison, the scriptures say in Acts 16, at about midnight, I just love that. About midnight. Why why does it have to tell us what time it is? Because midnight is what day is midnight? Yesterday, today, or tomorrow? It's right there, isn't it? I think it's this poetic phrase, about. It's not yesterday, because that's already happened. It's not tomorrow, it's about to come. But it's kind of in the present. But it's going to affect your past and affect your future. At about midnight, these guys have had a horrific day. It doesn't get any worse than this. Surely crying out to God's what you should do. Pray and I understand, but the scriptures say, Paul and Silas were singing praises and praying to God. They were declaring the greatness of God in that situation. I'm praying. Now, I understand, where are you, God? Rescue me. We're here because you told us to be here. This isn't going too well. Hey, you owe us one. Get us out of here. I understand that kind of praying. But they were praising. And that praise caused a collision in the heavenly realms that resulted in an earthquake, that resulted in all the prison doors being blown open. And long story short, Paul and Silas declare the freedom of Jesus to the jailer who surrenders his life to Jesus and he and his whole family are changed forever. The pathway to breakthrough was praise. In that situation, they decided to see God big and I think he became even bigger than they thought that day thirdly praising God is fuel it should be the fuel of your life and it's the fuel of the church it really is I've been in churches when you walk in and from the first note you just go wow King Jesus is here you just the fuel and the atmosphere of the room It is fuel. Let me talk about that briefly, about atmosphere of corporate worship, atmosphere. Um, There's an aroma that we give off. When we praise, we make declaration. We declare who God is and what he's done and who we make declaration. There is something very, very powerful. The words of your heart coming out of your mouth are very, very significant. Very, very important. It changes things significantly. So I remember being once going, trying to buy my wife expensive perfume and the lady behind the counter coming to me and saying, oh, have you ever thought how you're supposed to put perfume on? I'm like, I'm a guy, no. But have you ever thought about this? And I went, she said, let me just show you. If it's expensive perfume, this is what you do. You simply spray it in the air, step forward and let it fall on you. That's what you're supposed to do. Just go, and it, the aroma is all over you. Your words are a, you step in it and it falls all over you. What's coming out of your mouth? <laughs> That's why you stink. There's a declaration and a prayer. There is something about that. I want the aroma to be changed, the atmosphere to be changed. What I declare and what I sing are intrinsically connected, unbelievably so. And the final one of these things that is important is strength. There is a strengthening in your very core being of your bones when you praise. There's a weakness to strength moment, incredibly so. Hebrews 12, 28 calls about the kingdom is unshakable. Therefore, we will give thanks to God and worship him. His kingdom is unshakable. 
How do I encounter that unshakable? I declare it and I can encounter it. I can experience it. And I'll finish off before we get to baptisms with my favorite scripture of all time when it comes to worship. My favorite one of all time. It's in the book of Zephaniah. For those who don't understand their Bible, and this is a bit of a musical connection to help you out, the Old Testament, New Testament, in the final section of the Old Testament is a section of books called the Minor Prophets. There's 12 of them. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, that's there. But the final four, I think God was rapping because he makes them like, you can just remember them. It's super cool. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. It says the um, cha, um, um, cha. Zechariah, Malachi, Zechariah. Ha- anyway, I think it's true. I just really helps us. So Zephaniah is there. So you go to Matthew, take a left, and you get Malachi, then you get Zechariah, then you get Haggai, then you get Zephaniah. I just thought I'd bring that connection. I think it's funny. Nobody laughed, but anyway, moving on. <laughs> Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah is my favorite. And I wish I could give the whole thing, and maybe I will one day in a whole message. Verse 17. I mean, 14 through 17 is amazing, but verse 17. Capture this as I close this message and we go to baptism. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. Pause. He's with you, shepherd, father. He is mighty to save, king. We carry on. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. Are you feeling overwhelmed and restless? Encounter the grace of Jesus. He'll create, take great delight in you. God's love is not dependent on your behavior. It is by grace. He loves you. He'll quiet you with his love. And then here we go. <laughs> He will rejoice over you with singing. God sings. God sings. I still, in all these years, you know, I'm still trying to get my head around, what is that like? God sings. I said it at nine o'clock. Taylor can sing. He's an awesome singer. But God sings in 28,000 part harmony on his own. Like, I can't get my head around. It's not why, therefore, there is a connection, a divine connection in the whole history of music and the soul. Isn't there a whole connection with why is it that we tear up in a movie when the music changes? What is it? Because we're created in the image of God. And God sings. God sings. So when we're singing, it's like, bring it. It's something, there's a divine intersection with that. Divine, it's incredible. God sings. So as we move to baptism, those who are being baptized, come up on the platform now. Come on up on here. Just stand across here next to me. Come on up. Musicians will come up as well. You see, these people being baptized today, hurry up wherever you are, come on. Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit nervous. Come on. So those people being baptized, this is a declaration, an outward declaration of an inward transformation. An outward declaration of an inward conviction. An outward declaration by faith of who they are now living for. You see, this is a worship declaration. They're going to express, I choose to declare in public today that I will love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. So symbolically, for those who don't know what we're going to do right now, this pool here, what they do is when they step up to the side of the pool, it is symbolic of saying, my Jesus, King Jesus, came from heaven to earth. And on earth, he decided to start and reveal his new kingdom. And he went, hey, I am the way and the truth and the life. His teachings were light. His healings brought hope. His miraculous power brought incredible things. Jesus' life was incredible. Then when they get into the pool, they are symbolizing that moment of Jesus. He was obedient even to death on a cross. He so loved the world. 
He sacrificed his very own life to be a sacrifice once and for all. That death was the one-time atonement, payment for sin. The blood of Jesus cleansing us from all unrighteousness. The power to forgive. No longer do you have to pay God off. He paid it all. So that's the symbolism of in the pool. Then we lower them right under the water to symbolize burial. And burial is that it's over, done, no more life, buried. As far as the east is from the west, so far God has sent his sin, sent away. He's buried it once and for all. It is buried, but it's not over. And then they come up out of the water symbolizing the most significant moment in human history. And that is Jesus' resurrection. The dead becoming alive. But coming up out of the water symbolizes that in Christ we are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And that's when they come up out of the water, when we've got this worship song and praise song going. As we're worshiping, we'll see them there, you'll see them on screen. When they come out of the water, lose your mind in celebration. Just, just cheer and holler and whoop. Yes, you're congratulating them, but you're making a noise into the heavenlies that says, Jesus is king. Jesus is alive. And he lives in these people. They love him with everything. Declare it. It's like, yes, come on. And so you'll get to declare it like crazy, like we baptized like seven people at the nine o'clock, and there's like 12 people today being baptized during COVID. Anyway, moving on. So it's pretty incredible. But so you guys, I'm going to ask you some questions now, and you answer with a big, bold yes. If the answers are no, you can go and sit down. <laughs> but I know it's a yes. Do you believe the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins, and have you repented of them? And do you declare Jesus Christ to be your King, your Lord, and your Savior? And do you seek through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to live for Him on His mission all the days of your life? Yeah. It's on that confession of faith that will baptize you into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A new creature with a new feature, with a new purpose. Amazing. Amazing. So if you guys line up on the side there, on that side, you'll come into the pool. When you get out, take a left. Yeah? So we have that system. That's awesome. That's super great. I'm going to invite everybody to stand. We're going to be having a, a praise and worship song whilst we're doing this so you can see the words and see what's happening there. We're going to be singing that he turns graves into gardens. He turns bones into armies. You know, he, he's the one. He's the only one who can. There's something so powerful about this. So sing your heart out. Get it out. He is king. He is shepherd. He is leader. He is father. Incredible. Celebrate with all of this. We've got Pastor Tim, our uh, pastor of care and connection in there. And Kyle's our director of young adults in the pool right now, which is super awesome. So are we good? Are we good? I'll see you all next week. All right.